Hello, I am back after mysterious absence. Let's have a catch up. So I'll talk about three things then. One is Blair, Blair's speech. Um, second thing is white paper, what's that mean? And then third thing is what are we doing at Scientists for EU now? Now, uh, Blair's speech, the, the, the newest news, I guess, is think about it this way. If you think Blair's speech is going to convert people and um, make people rise up, it's not. But that's not really <clears throat> the purpose of it. Think of the purpose of it more like this. Politics is a little soap opera in which only certain characters get the media attention. And currently, <clears throat> the soap opera looks something like this. A, a BDSM scene with Theresa May as the Dom, Jeremy Corbyn as, as the sub, you know, he, he's the victim, um, he's getting Brexit, um, he's really loving it, but he's pretending that he doesn't want Brexit, he's the victim, he's all gagged and everything, and Theresa May, this is her role to be all serious and severe and give us the hardest Brexit possible, and there's a little a panel of, of, of right-wing hardcore Brexiteer supporters egging her on. And the rest of us are kind of like watching in horror, but we, we can't have a say in the soap opera because it's a little sort of TV show. And Nick Clegg is, is trying to shout that this is all going in the wrong direction, but he's only a small character. So now Tony Blair can. He can, he can walk into this because he is um, one of the major characters. I mean, he was the lead character or lead villain for three series of, of this particular soap opera. So what Tony Blair can do and has done is basically everything that, that we were saying in all of our different pro-EU campaigns that weren't getting through to the media, well, he's bundled them all up, put them in a sort of little hand grenade, walked into the middle of this soap opera and just sort of um, dropped it there and sort of and blown it up. And so all of the arguments about, you know, this isn't going to change immigration, it's going to take our eyes off the uh, outside the EU immigration, which is the problem with integration with communities. This whole thing is being hijacked by the, the hardcore Brexiteers. Brexit means that we've got no bandwidth left for the NHS and things like that. <clears throat> all of these arguments, he has been able to deliver at that top level, that disruptive level. And it was a very competent talk. It's interesting to see the reaction because, of course, it's high profile. And so all of the <clears throat> hardcore Brexiteers, you know, they've all been, you know, squealing like, like piglets and attacking him, but none of the content. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to note as well that Jeremy Corbyn um, plucked the gag out of his mouth to say Tony Blair is being very unhelpful and this Brexit bondage should reach its climax. But, but what, what has happened is this, by Tony Blair doing that and saying that, you know, he is encouraging the people to rise up and noting that there are all these different campaigns, it opens the door somewhat for all of the arguments we've had before and all the presence of all the different campaigns to then actually be more noticed by the media. Now, onto the white paper. Um, was that any good? No, obviously not, because what was needed was some kind of business plan. Is the white paper a business plan? No, because a standard competent business plan would have a, um, a SWOT analysis, for example, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Did we get that kind of balance with all the you know safety nets of how we could fill in you know a detailed play by play? What are the milestones? What are the key performance indicators? <clears throat> of course not. It was just a propaganda document all about the the strengths and the opportunities. It was more like um, sounding the the trumpet, sounding the clarion before riding into battle, so that we we'll all feel kind of pumped up and strong. So in, uh, in uh, science and research and innovation, that section was just about how great our universities are and how many Nobel Prize winners we have produced in the past, which would be an interesting point if all of those universities and all of those Nobel Prize winners had said, Brexit, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Then we're talking about how that supports us going forward. The fact that were saying that in the white paper when not one of these universities and not one of these Nobel Prize winners thinks that Brexit is a good idea is a little bit perverse. It's like saying the Sherpas are telling us not to go up the mountain, but we will go up the mountain and we'll be fine because these Sherpas know what they're talking about.
So um, the white paper helps us nothing. So it's down to our community to forge plans forward. And this is goes into the last part now. What are scientists for EU doing? So what we're doing is is in two parts. First of all, um, we we have always, since the referendum result, and actually even before, been planning on what would Brexit look like and how we could dodge the bullets, how we could get round it. And so a lot of what we'll be arguing is for keeping the pan-European cohesion, doubling down on the European research area, investing more in that, even if we get kicked down slightly on Horizon 2020 and out of policy decisions. Still, there are other things we can do to build up bilateral relationships with Eastern Europe, for example, in order to really strengthen the European research area, which is something that's very important, not just for our country and our science community, but also the negotiations as a whole, so that hopefully in, in years down the line, if, if we are dragged down Brexit, then as people like Farage try and kick up a verbal and other kinds of warfare with our neighbours, we can say, look, do you want this destructive model or look at what the scientists are building in terms of cohesion? Public, choose which one you want. So that's one thing to, to build that new route of cohesion, that safety net, as it were. But of course, the other thing is, all during this time, we will continue to argue that the very um, best model for this country is to be working as fully as possible with all of our European colleagues, with, with all of those countries. Full membership is the best way to have the full democratic input on all of the decision making. So we will continue to argue that as well. So sort of dual purpose there. So there's your update. I hope you enjoyed it.